Okay, record on this computer. Hi, I'm Renee Hobbs. Uh, welcome to Library Film Education, LSC 597. It's the spring semester. I'm here with the amazing students of the University of Rhode Island's Harrington School of Communication and, and Media, and these are the graduate library students. Uh, and we have uh, a good team tonight here. I see Kim, I see Megan, Bill, Pam, Robin, and uh, if you're not uh, watching us, uh, if you're not participating live, hopefully, uh, Britt, Jordana, the other Emily, hopefully you're watching the recording. So really, really glad about that. Um, okay, so uh, we have a big, big agenda, but obviously the first thing on the agenda is uh, the, the, the issue that some of you have raised for me about the challenges of doing an experiential learning uh, thing like what we're doing. Uh, for some of you, this is an absolute delight. It's really clear. And for some of you, the experiential learning component is an absolute nightmare. And so I want to be sensitive to that. And uh, for, for reasons that have to do with your life, your schedule, or whatever, um, if you need to, um, if you need to find an alternative way to manage through this program, I am, you know, more than happy to support that. So, um, if doing an experiential library program with a partner is, it's just not working out. I can see from the base camp that some teams are really on fire. Other teams are moving forward, and some teams haven't seemed to make any progress at all. So if you um, feel like doing an experiential learning program is impossible for your life right now, then I'd like you to propose an alternative project. You can do that by first looking at the list of learning outcomes that are presented on the syllabus and think about what could you do that would help you advance those competencies, the same learning outcomes for the course, since that's an important equity issue. And then I invite you to think about the client, the Providence Children's Film Festival, and think about their many, many needs, and maybe even have a conversation with Anissa Rauf, who's made herself super available to us. Right? I mean, in so many ways. She's, she's on the base camp <laughs> posting and commenting, right? And um, I'd certainly welcome the opportunity to brainstorm with you if you, uh, if you uh, would like to brainstorm ideas for an alternative assignment. Um, but I'm going to ask you to put forward the uh, ideas and develop an alternative plan if that, if that is a uh, I think she's coming back, right? I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying to come back. I don't know. I don't know how much. I don't know how much. Uh, I, how much of me you saw before I, I, I got so rudely uh, uh, kicked out of my own meeting. <laughs> it was a great bill frame, Renee. Oh no! Really? <laughs> no, <Is it> like <laughs> something like that. Oh shit. <laughs> My condolences. I'm so sorry you had to see me in, in new <laughs> grimace, right? Ah, not so nice. So where did you lose me? What have I, what, what, do I need to say anymore? Or did you, what, what part of the me message did you get? Anyone want to summarize what I, what you think you heard me say? Well, you were just on saying how we would all get A's in this class. <laughs> <laughs> Doing whatever we wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> no, you okay. said that we could uh, propose an alternative uh, based on the um, outcomes of the class the, mm -hmm. and, and that we had to come up with it and present it to you. Very nice. And I, and I also said that you can consult with Anissa Rauf, our client, and me if you want to brainstorm a proposal. But I would certainly need to see that proposal for an alternative assignment in hand before, hopefully before we leave for spring break. 
that would be ideal. And if not, then immediately after spring break, I think we could manage that. Uh, do you guys have any questions about that? Because I certainly don't want to have this be a, a you know, a, a adversarial and nightmarish or other kind of craziness. Do you have any questions about that? Okay, cool. If you do, let me know. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my grand adventures just because they are kind of relevant to the film library context. In fact, uh, uh, it's been amazing. The last, uh, the last uh, I have a, basically a 15 day trip. I started uh, last week in Austin, Texas uh, at the South by Southwest Education Conference. South by Southwest, as you may know, is a month long program that includes education, film, music, uh, and interactive media, each week devoted to a, a, a remarkable, a, self, you know, a, a festival, like a film festival, except it's, uh, it's just a showcase of really interesting uh, stuff. And I was there uh, on a panel uh, talking a little bit about virtual reality in education. Um, because I had the amazing experience last summer of being able to go to Israel, work with a group of educational technologists, and make a virtual reality app. So uh, we got to do that again with the um, with the team in in Texas, and um, you know, with the rise of Google Cardboard, which is the new virtual reality glasses, and the investment by the New York Times in virtual reality journalism, virtual reality in education is you know, the next new thing. And I appropriately problematized it in terms of the limitations of the technology. Um, but I also talked a little bit about how virtual reality is um, <laughs> something John Dewey would be really cool on. Can I right? just say, can I just say my fiance will not put the Google Cardboard thing down <laughs> he likes it, huh? Yeah, and this roller coaster thing, he was really mad. He had to pay $5 for it. <laughs> it's has, a new thing, and he won't put it down. Has he seen the, the New York Times cool virtual journalism? That stuff is awesome. I don't wow. know. It's I don't know. Cool. I'm scared to show him anything else as virtual reality. <laughs> What, what my, my basic argument is that 120 years ago, John Dewey said that people learn best through experiences. Not listening to lecturers, not reading books, and not writing papers, and not giving speeches. People learn best by doing things and then reflecting on their actions. That's the premise of this course, right? So we could think of this course as a kind of virtual reality, right? And just imagine doing it when we could all be in the same digital space. And it would be a three-dimensional space. And we could experience each other in three dimensions. It might be cool. So if, 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 digital, if virtual reality technologies allow us to have more deeply experiential learning, then I'm all for it. Right? Okay. All right. So, well, and so now I've moved from Texas. Can you guys give me a thumbs up? Are you hearing me? I can't quite tell if the internet is working now. Uh-oh. Maybe not. <laughs> what do you, do you think this is still recording? It is. It's oh, still it's totally recording. Right. It's oh. going to be weird, huh? Yeah, so don't say anything bad about me because I'll be able to watch the recording, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see what no, I was missing. Too late. <laughs> Can we do that George on Seinfeld thing where we sneak in and <laughs> undo the tape? <laughs> oh, my God. You know, it's, did I mention that it was one in the morning here? And I stayed up till one in the morning to hang with you guys tonight. Did I mention that? No. Okay. So this is kind of weird karma. All right, so here I am in Brussels, in Brussels, uh, Belgium. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it is. And um, I am one of the cast of characters for a really interesting conference called Media and Learning. 
Uh, my shtick at this conference is media literacy, propaganda, and radicalization. You guys know that I created a interactive crowdsourced website called mindovermedia.tv, which allows any person anywhere in the world to upload examples of contemporary propaganda. It's a tool that helps teachers teach about the new forms of propaganda that are part of our everyday life, including sponsored content and viral media. Um, and you'll never guess that, but after the Charlie Hebdo uh, attacks that killed 13 people in Paris, and the fact that all of the gunmen involved were all here from Belgium, right? Uh, there's a lot of interest around how uh, young people might be radicalized and what responsibilities the state has, the government and the education system have for promoting people who are critical thinkers and not vulnerable to propaganda that tells them to go out and do a jihad and, and kill Westerners. So it's been fascinating. We've had ministers. I've had incredible conversations with policymakers here. Uh, it's been fun. And I'm learning a lot. And um, so, yeah. And I feel really proud to be able to bring this interactive tool to a global audience. So it's been great. And when I see you next week, I will be in Sweden. <laughs> so it just keeps getting better and better. Thank God for online learning. All right. Why can't we go on your field trips? <laughs> Good point. We just get to go to uh, like an hour, two hours, three hours away. You get to go to Sweden. and <laughs> Yeah, well, what are you going to do? Life is good. Life is good. Um, okay, so I've just reported on my grand adventures. I want to hear a progress report on what have you done with your LEAP project planning. I hear there's some good news to report. Right, Bill? Yes, yes. I was talking to the people in Westerly about my PFE today, and uh, they were very positive about me being able to do a program there. So Britt and I will be uh, will be doing that. Congratulations! Doing a program for them this summer. So you and Britt are got the green light to do a program this April, mm -hmm. and you also have a green light to do a summer library program as well. A film yes, library as my, program as part of my PFE. Yes. <sighs> So very exciting. Congratulations. That is thrilling. Uh, mm -hmm. Pam, you've made some progress as well. Can you tell us about uh, what you, what, what's going on in your life? Why don't I hand it over to Megan, my partner? Megan, you want to report on what we've done? Is she there? I'm trying to unmute. OK. Hi. Okay. Um, well, we actually were able to meet up yesterday, which was wonderful. Pam came down to the campus to visit me. Um, we have set up with Fox Point Library in Providence to do Let's Get Rhythm as an after school program, which is super exciting. Um, and we're just kind of working out the logistics at this point. That is fantastic. Fox Point is a fabulous choice. Now talk to me about Let's Get Rhythm. Why did you choose it and what is it? Pam, you want to take that? You know a little bit more about it than I do at this yeah, point. I actually saw it um, uh, at the Wanskuk Library where they also did a uh, workshop during the uh, Ch Providence Children's Film Festival. It's a um, film all about the significance and uh, global reach of girls' handicapping games. Oh my God, how cool! You it mean really, like, like yeah, my it, mother told me? I was, <laughs> that's what you mean by hand clapping games? Uh oh, oh boy, oh boy. In her California neighborhood and uh, that's what piqued her interest and so she started looking into it and I think it took her years and years and years to put this together and she wasn't a filmmaker at all she was a music teacher and um, 
So it's an interesting film. It's a documentary. It, it uh, had its challenges at the um, Wanskuk Library in keeping kids' attention because it's a documentary. But um, I wrote my leap, one of my leaps about it, I think, um, or at least one of my blog posts or whatever. And um, I had made some suggestions, so I kind of figured maybe we could put our money where my mouth was and try to see if the suggestions I made would work in another workshop and film screening. Nice. Nice. Wow. That's, that's great progress. So you have got the, you've got the content and you've got the target audience and you have the location. Congratulations. Uh, Kim, what's the story with your, you and your team? Have you made any progress and what progress have you made? We have. Um there's a couple people in Westerly. Ours is actually going to be at Pocatuck Middle School um, because I work in the Stonington school system. Great. Um, I and my mom is the secretary there, so I you know I grew up in that school. I didn't go to the school, but I yeah basically grew up there. Um, so it it doesn't feel weird at all to go in and be like. Hey Tim, you're the principal. Can I talk to you about a thing? And he's like, "Yeah, your mom's a troublemaker." Nice. So that is fantastic. So, so this is a library. This is a school community you know well because you grew up there. Yeah. Those teachers would jump off a cliff for your mom, and so by definition, they, they would do anything. Like, yeah. yeah. Um. Actually, it's not a problem, obviously, but I'm trying to the project to me and Emily because so many people are like yeah we're doing all this stuff for you and I'm just like well I want to say yes but then it would take this project away from us <laughs> but they're all, they're all really eager um we plan on showing paper planes and because of it's a middle school so we have to kind of work around their um their system we have to show it in two parts mm -hmm. um so we're going to show the first half one day when there's less after school activity and then we're going to have the kids make their paper airplanes and then the next time we're going to finish the movie and they're going to have a con a throwing contest in the hallway right. um and the principal has offered to give us um dairy queen little five dollar dairy queen coupons for prizes because Dairy Queen in Westerly in Pocatuck is like a religious experience. I don't know why. It's kind of like a holiday when it opens. It really is. So they're going to flip. Oh, <laughs> that is fantastic. So I love the pieces. Mm -hmm. There's a screening. There's yeah. an experiential learning component. And then there's like a celebration that includes ice cream. That's, that sticks with a kid forever. I hope right? so. <laughs> awesome any chance you can get the school librarian to do some kind of special curated i'm i'm hoping to like talk to her maybe i know um yeah i've been doing a little bit of research on the movie and i know i don't know if it's been done yet but there's um a novelization of the script oh nice um i don't know enough about it yet because i just kind of saw that in passing so it'd be cool if there is a book. Yeah. I have the book there. Yeah. Um, to see if any of these kids are like, wow, I just saw the movie. I can, there's a book. What? Cool. Oh. Cool, cool, cool. So uh, next week, we're going to learn a little bit more about the rights issues involved for all of you. So know that we're going to mm -hmm. move through a process of understanding. Here's the good news, bad news. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's actually uh, Kim. I'm so glad that you're doing this in a, a school because it actually helps us explain the different how the different uh, licensing rules apply. Because you're using the film as an ed, part of, a fundamental part of the educational experience of the kids, you're going to claim fair use under Section 1101, and that means no payment, no permission. That's the power of fair use. That's something that occurred to me. I was like, you know, I, it's been brought up before, like, oh, you need rights to show this. But, nope. you know, as yeah. someone who works in a high school library and the principal.
library they're not yeah. maybe you can, uh, maybe you can donate it to the local library then make a yeah and maybe and tell the kids that and then see if they yeah it out. <laughs> great film did you see it i haven't it's been i recorded it on my dvr and then it got kicked off my dvr because it's been on our movie channels yeah. um so much to talk about with I, it I think Zoom made me the host of the meeting. Yes. Oh, how wonderful. I'm so glad that's, <laughs> that somebody is the host of the meeting. So that's kind of good to know that when I, when I, uh, whoever you were, because you were talking when it, I cut out. So thank you for being the host of the meeting. I have the power. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, it's exciting. Am I the teacher now? Can I grade all these women? <laughs> You, as we said before, everybody's getting an A, right? What's <laughs> 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 happening tonight? <laughs> All right. Well, in honor of making such great progress uh, as your as these teams have, I feel really happy about um, the momentum that you have got. Uh, I want to re uh, want to reiterate this idea that um, by your using Basecamp for your program development and your collaborative process, there's two or three great things. One is you're discovering the power of a collaborative digital tool, like a project management software, like Basecamp. The other thing is that your planning process is transparent, so that we're, when it's all said and done, we're able to review the choices you made and the strategies you used and think about the relationship between your planning process and your execution, right? And for library programming, there's nothing better than being able to connect the, the choices you make in the planning process to the execution. In fact, I'd say that's the difference between uh, folks who really learn how to do programming well and people who never get the hang of it. Uh, so by making the planning process transparent, it really amps up your ability to reflect and assess your own your own choices so that's a big thing about base camp i know that you are experiencing some pros and cons to it can you talk to me a little bit about how you're experiencing the use of base camp as as part of your program planning and even in this early phase what's the experience like for you what do you like and dislike about base camp now that you've had a chance to use it a little bit more I'm not really experiencing it. <laughs> yeah, I noticed. I noticed. Yeah, I'm actually probably um, gonna look at the other. I'm gonna try to switch groups. I think because I don't really want to. It's a lot of work. Right, right now things feel like a lot as it is, and I just I kind of wanted, you know, just stick to <laughs> what's already assigned. So, and they're kind of out of the way. So my group mates. So, and they're not on. So Robin, <laughs> on. One, one possibility is uh, th some members of these teams here tonight might adopt you, right? And that's okay, because that's, that would work, if that works for them, sent out a request. works for you, yeah, uh, I, I think that's I have fine. sent out a request. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully by next week. So right now, if for at least for Robin, the base camp yeah. isn't working very well. What, what are other people's experience with it? What are your the highlights and lowlights of it as as you're experiencing it so far i like that we can have documents just like available and that you can see it's nice that you can see the progress we're making because you're grading us on the progress but at the same time like it's so much easier for me and emily to just text each other sure yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know like i mean obviously it's going to be easier to just go Yes. Instead of going to base camp and finding our document um, yeah. and doing all that. I, for the life of me, I have so much trouble finding the document. I had to bookmark it. Oh. I, I, cannot, I, like, I have no idea where it is. Right. Right. So, <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. And I definitely appreciate how texting is for, especially when your partner is only one person, mm -hmm. definitely a superior easy to use technology yeah and email, and, we email a lot yeah it, it, so it looks like really Megan you and your team you're actually it looks like you're actually creating 
documents embedded in Basecamp that then become that kind of become organic um, exa uh, metaphors or ex uh, tools for your planning process. So does that feel like a pain in the ass? Is it a good thing? How are you experiencing it? I think it's been really helpful. Um, I like to be able to have everything in one place, and it's sort of has been like like a Pinterest of sort for this project, you know. Mm -hmm. So. So and I know it's, it's been helping Pam and I communicate with Anissa, even though we've been in contact with her via email, too. It's just nice to be able to look at it all together. Yeah. I was pleased to see Anissa was commenting on it. And Bill, how are you experiencing the uh, base camp? Uh, He'll sit next to me doing whatever he's doing on his iPad, and then you'll occasionally see him just kind of look over the side of the computer. <laughs> and then as soon as he sees himself on the screen, he'll get scared and he'll just dash away. <laughs> My parents like to sneak around me, see what's going on, and then walk away and make inappropriate comments. <laughs> <laughs> well, he likes to see what I'm emailing. So. <laughs> My mother. <laughs> Are we talking about parrot over shoulder? <laughs> my, my microphone is not muted. <laughs> <laughs> I like it how the family members make appearances in our class occasionally. That's charming. So wonderful. So wonderful. Um, all right. Well, what, what, what say you now at 730? What say you, we do a viewing and discussion? If you, I, I'm not going to show you my screen because I don't have the bandwidth to do that, obviously. But I've picked out a really cool trailer for us to watch. It's from India. So uh, see if you can navigate yourself to our homepage for tonight. And it takes about three minutes to watch the trailer. Let's watch the trailer. And then we're going to talk a little bit about it. Right? You know the focus questions we're going to ask tonight are, is this a movie you might be interested in seeing? Why or why not? The second question I'm going to ask you to think about is, this movie makes grand and glorious use of stereotypes. What stereotypes do you notice and what do they mean to you? And the third question that I'm going to ask you is, stories always have an arc that includes rising action, and then resolution. Can you uh, predict or anticipate some of the rising action and some of the resolution? All right, with those three focus questions in mind, let's watch the trailer.
Okay, give me a thumbs up when you're done watching. Okay, so why don't we start with the first question? Is this um, is this the kind of movie you choose to see? Why or why not? Who wants to go first? I say. Oh. <laughs> um, I would see it. It looks fun. Um. Yeah, it looks it looks fun and interesting, but it, it's such a choppy trailer, and it's like they just took The trailer. Mm -hmm. That is interesting. I couldn't tell whether um, the kids in the beginning were adults in the end, and I'm not sure how that fits in the seven days, but it intrigues me enough to want to find out. Mm -hmm. And why were the subtitles when they were speaking in English? I don't <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be the accents that, that woman had an accent. I yeah. think it might be that. And yeah. if it's a kid's movie, the kid yeah. might have a hard time understanding. I suppose. But as adults, we we probably have a better ear for it by now, maybe. I often need subtitles for British movies. <laughs> and my mother's British. <laughs> oh, deadly. Fucking deadly. <laughs> so, uh... So, so we get some different reactions, and we're noticing that this uh, this particular trailer doesn't use a typical narrative arc at all. So it's really hard to figure it out. Let's open up the door to talk about stereotypes, and then your predictions about what kinds of conflicts are you expecting this movie might feature as as it uses rising action to increase dramatic tension even even in a family movie so what about stereotypes well, and what about well, rising action there's one thing i'm actually a little confused on with the no more movies that's constantly repeated i don't see them actually watching any movies at all in the thing so are they talking about because i see a lot of like the the like dancing around the fooling around are they talking about making movies or are they talking about actually seeing them because that's what i've noticed that's like a that was what I was kind of hung up on in the <laughs> preview. Great, great point. That ambiguity is really not uh, clearly established. So your prediction is maybe it's about making movies, maybe it's about watching movies. It's not really clear. Thanks for, thanks for pointing that out. What else? Uh, would a stereotype be like the disapproving adult? Yeah. <laughs> or, or overprotective parent? Yeah. Disapproving you know. adults and overprotective parents. That's a good story. He has to be, be really smart at school because you see him a lot with the backpack and them saying no more movies and then you see him running with the backpack a lot. So. Yep, yep. The, the overachiever has to be perfect and get an A boy. Any other stereotypes that you recognized? There was a dance scene towards the end. This and is one girl. Uh, yeah, I don't know how many of you have seen Indian films. I have. <laughs> Lots of dance. dance there has to be at least a big dance number at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> Almost a requirement, okay? Good. <laughs> and what kind of conflicts are you, if you had to predict, what kind of conflicts are you going to see in this film? If you had to predict. Parent, child. Oh, yeah. What else? Cult I thought there's going to be some cultural conflicts. What do you mean by cultural conflict? I, don't, I just felt like the um, like costuming and such. Yeah. It seemed very 
alarming how much skin there was being shown. Yeah. Old, old India, new India. Good. Yeah. We, saw, we saw Indian women in traditional clothing. We saw Indian women in modern clothing. Maybe yeah, cultural class. With class. the hijabs. I didn't notice that. Hijabs. Good. If you get it from pronouncing it right. <laughs> Good. So it, it is quite interesting to think about how much we got in that two minutes of really badly produced trailer, yeah. right? We got a lot. And we got an interesting conversation that activated a lot of our background knowledge, right? So thank you so much for sharing that. Now I want to turn to something that I think was I've never done before, and I am dying to hear about what you thought of it. I've been kind of, as you tweet about them, I've been reading and enjoying them. What was it like to compose a listicle as a form of synthesis? What did you like about the process? What did you hate about the process? What did you notice about making a listicle? I wasn't sure I did it right, so. <laughs> same, on the same boat as you. No idea. <laughs> I was kind of sure of the right amount of things to put in. <laughs> I made a numerical bullet point about being a sad adult and creating a program. <laughs> Basically, there's a picture of a man looking sad and holding a teddy bear. It's all very, it's very touching. So, but, you, so it sounds like you had fun with this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, well, about those short readings we had to read. <laughs> oh, start with the forty-four pager. Uh, that was fun. That was easy. <laughs> Did you see the, the chocolate bars with the prescription? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm on the librarian. That I was like, I think I, I think I might have ADHD or something because I like the Pinterest kind of thing is like way too busy for me. Mm. I need to focus on like one thing at a time. So a Pinterest board is like, ah! Mm -hmm. Using it for school is probably a little bit difficult because of that reason, yeah. but it's great for recipes. Yeah, no, no, oh, yeah. I, I have friends who it. It. For school, it's it's a little it's overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All I do on Pinterest pretty much is bookmark recipes I want to make. <laughs> and dream houses I'll never have. <laughs> I feel like Pinterest. I have a mixed reaction, Pam. I agree with you that I sometimes feel overwhelmed. But I also feel like I am starting to become aware of how I use different kinds of scanning, browsing, and scanning and browsing are really important strategies for dealing with online content. And I'm mm. more aware of how, uh, how my scanning of images is different mm. than my scanning of text. So I think, it's, I think Pinterest has helped increase my sensitivity to like being aware of my own biases around when I browse, when, when I browse visually, uh -huh. versus when I browse in other, through with text, text material. No, so interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm a little torn about it. It's cool, but yeah, no, I'm not, not really sure. Uh, you know, I'm not really sure of my own biases toward visual content. And it, Pinterest makes me more aware of that. Um, okay, I'm really ha I'm glad that you had fun with the listicles. I'm glad that you were able to use it as a tool uh, for synthesis. So let me talk a little bit about uh, the even more fun we're going to have this week, right? So this week, because I was really aware that, you know, the reading is like, blah, and yet, man, such cool stuff. So here's what we're going to do for, uh, for this week. Uh, next, the topic, all the, all the essays next week are in one way or the other about making media in libraries and making media. So we've been spending the whole semester really talking about ourself our, ourself and young audiences as consumers or viewers or analysts of 
film. Next week, we're talking about young people as makers of film. So first, what I'd like to do is talk to you about the readings that you're going to do. And then I'd, I'd like to talk to you about the idea that you're going to be tweeting about the readings. Um, so the first thing that we're looking at is the short, short piece in the Huffington Post called Vancouver's Public Library's Inspiration Lab just made learning cool. And this is really about the trend in libraries to include a maker space or a media production space in the library. I want everybody to read that article. But then the next pieces I've kind of assigned you uh, for reasons, of, reasons that might or might not be obvious. Um, so I'd like Bill, Kim, and Robin to read the British Film Institute piece called Using Film in Schools, a practical guide. I'd like Emily Z and Britta to read the um, article called Participatory Culture at the Echo Park Film Center, which is about a nonprofit media arts organization and their use of media production activity. I'd like Jordana and Megan, I'd like you guys to read the piece called Congregating to Create for Social Change urban youth media production and sense of community, right? And Pam and Emily V, I've, I've given you the heavy lifting for the <laughs> Mimi Ito piece. And really it's a summary, so read the summary. It's, it's a, a place where you can do some strategic browsing, right, as that piece is, is, a, is a heavy lift and it's really the first, mm, 25 or so, 20, 25 or 30 pages that are going to be most useful, giving you the sense of that piece. Um, but here's what I want you to do. We're going to have a tweet chat about the readings this week. So we're going to use Twitter to share information and insights on what we're reading. After reading the article you've been assigned, I want you to compose nine, count them, nine tweets. You'll be summarizing, sharing an opinion, and asking a question in response to what you've learned. Now remember that a well-formed tweet uses concision to strategically convey an idea and promote dialogue with your community. Include the film library, uh, the library film ed hashtag and the author's name on every tweet. You may choose to curate additional content that extends or connects to key ideas from the reading. This is good librarianship. Right? As you come across an idea that intrigues you, go poke around and find other stuff on that. Important characters. Oh, that's yeah. why I'm glad oh, I have so many. Ito as my <laughs> author. <laughs> oh, he's our author. Let's see. <laughs> I get the short one. Oh, oh the British Film Institute. That sucks. Oh, <laughs> come on. BFI. BFI. That's half the tweet. <laughs> well, then it'll be really easy for us to have nine tweets. <laughs> That's it. But remember, you have to have ten. There's what you have to have ten. Just just noticing. So finish yeah. the line, right? So you have to reply to somebody else's tweet. So don't forget okay. about that last one. Okay. And that's the minimum. So there is no maximum. Just <laughs> All right. Oh. What questions do you guys have about that? Fun, right? Should be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's just talk a little bit about the best way this will work. In the context of Twitter, Twitter's like a river, okay? The Twitter river is running day and night. And you can put your toe into it and take a look at it now. And, and an hour from now, it's going to be completely different. And tomorrow, it'll be completely different. And when you follow the hashtag library film ed, it's kind of nice to follow it over time. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be checking in on the library film ed hashtag every day. And I'm going to be commenting on your comments because I picked these readings for a reason. <laughs> I have some opinions about it, right? So I'm going to be talking to you all week long in little bits in 10 minutes at a time, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. That's how it's going to work. So it will be better for our conversation if you don't dump this all in one, you know, in one, you know, <laughs> one hot mess. It, that's it. It actually probably will be better if you, uh, you know, 
do the ones that are summarizing and then do the opinions right and then do the replies over time because that's what twitter that's a kind of like a bias of twitter uh and then that means our conversation are going to intersect because these, these readings actually kind of talk to each other the ideas in the bfi piece are going to be in conflict a little bit with some of the Ito pieces and the stuff about the social justice stuff in the urban school is going to be completely different than Echo Park in and the some of the challenges in that in that context. So in a way we we're going to play with how these arguments relate to each other on the Twitter, right? And so that means that we're you got to think about like it's almost like we're being in another kind of conversation. It's asynchronous because we're not going to be in the same time like we are now, but it might work. It might work. So let's give it a try, huh? All right. Do you guys have any questions about that? Okay. All right. I have one quick question. Yeah. Uh, my author is the British Film Institute, I think. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, I think Pam might have suggested BFI. Is that okay for? Absolutely. Saying? That's how they call themselves. And and feel free to also uh, reference them. BFI is very active on the Twitter stream, right? So find their Twitter handle and you know let them in to the conversation. I would I would like you to realize that when a tweet is a public thing, we're, even though you only have twenty followers or forty followers. When I retweet you, you have 5,000 people reading that tweet. And I will be retweeting you. So realize you're making kind of a public argument in a public space. And that's kind of the power of Twitter is that we may find that our talk about these articles inspires other librarians, teachers, and media makers. Who knows, right? So that's kind of cool. All right, other questions? All right, you guys have wasted another hour, and and you know what I'm going to be doing right after this class, which is I'm going to bed. I'm going to bed. I will see you next week. Have a great week. Enjoy enjoy the week. Have fun, and I'll see you next week. Bye bye. Bye. Good night. Out, please out. Okay, kicker.